Okay, we are in chapter 3, RA signal processing section and introduction to digital signal processing, this chapter. Let's look at and see what this chapter, what's involved in this particular chapter, what we will be learning. We will be first learning introduction to digital signal processing, what is it? Then we are looking at various things associated with the digital signal processing such as quantization, sampling, aliasing, very important, aliasing is very, very important. Then we look at introduction to digital filters, and then we look at digital filter structures, and then look at various types of, different types of filters with minimum phase, maximum phase, and then we look at the stability of the filter, especially second order filter. And then we move on to digital oscillator. What is a digital oscillator? Like an analog oscillator, how do you design a digital oscillator? Then, at the last part, we look at uh, notch filters. Uh, notch filters are filters which will remove one particular frequency. If you, for example, 50 hertz hum, you want to remove that, you use a notch filter. So, by the end of this chapter, you will have a reasonably good understanding of what is a digital filter and the type of filters and different things that are frequency response, uh, like magnetic response, phase response, all is embedded in this. Especially that you need to understand what is aliasing. Aliasing is a type of distortion. So we will go through that all in this chapter. So introduction to digital signal processing, which we call DSP. And uh, basically, uh, because of the availability of low-cost digital signal processors, manufacturers are producing plug-in cards nowadays for basically all the PCs, which can do the coding, the coding of signal, uh, that means converting analog signal to digital signal, and use the computer or onboard process to process the uh, digital signal, and then you can play back. Um, and uh, all these are done uh, by digital signal processing processes or tools. And there are many, many areas where you are using digital signal processing. And for one or two examples, for example, audiologists and speech therapists are using DSP system for testing a person's level of hearing. So that's also a DSP system. And uh, and then testing whether they need a hearing aid filtering. So they actually measure the frequency response of the ear, um, and, and by measuring that, there's a technique they use to measure, and, and it's a DSP processor which sends the signals and receives the signals and does the measurement. And in music industry also, DSP is very important, and to look at music signal, and how do you filter the music signal? If you are going to filter music signal, uh, what is important? Is it magnitude is important or phase is important? So they, you will learn all of those. That's also important. Analyzing the speech, analyzing the music and filtering them is a major importance in, in, in the music world. In summary, you can come up with many applications where DSP is used, and I have, I have I outlined few applications where you use them in control system, power system, biomedical engineering, instrumentation, telecommunication, speech analysis, and video processing, everywhere you use digital signal processing. As soon as uh, sample the signal into digital signal, if you want to process them, you must have the digital signal processing knowledge. So what you are learning now, uh, a one-dimensional signal processing, can be extended to two dimensions, such as a, a, a small image which is a two-dimensional data. And uh, what you are learning in this course is a one-dimensional signal processing. And, uh, and uh, the, the fundamental knowledge that you gather is applicable to any signal processing um, um, field. People will wonder why are we using the signal processing techniques? The major thing is high reliability and reproducibility. If you write a small program for filtering, and you can run that any time, as many times you want, the same answer you get for the same input. But if you design a filter using an analog component, and if you run the experiment many times, 
the output won't be all the same because uh, if the components start to drift, depends on the temperature, then then reproducibility becomes a problem. And the analog filters, whereas digital filters, is easy. And also DSP is very important because you can program a DSP processor and you can do a lot of things with that. And component drift problem. There's no components in the DSP. Or everything is represented by ones and zeros and there's no drift as such and therefore that's not a problem. And also, using DSP technique, you can take data and compress them. For example, speech signal is, uh, has got a lot of redundancy. You can actually compress it, still having the same quality. So, so DSP techniques are used everywhere uh, for, for, uh, um, for this application, uh, for these reasons as well. And uh, the other thing is the DSP hardware allows you to program operations and also nowadays there are a lot of software available, a lot of algorithms are available um, uh, which have been developed over the last 40 years of DSP knowledge. Uh, people have developed various algorithms so we can use them straight away. And uh, so the, because of many applications, it's a vast growth of DSP theory and its application over the past decade, but it's not past decade, past many decades, um, DSP has been, uh, been developed. Initially, basic digital filtering, people spent a lot of, lot of time in back in 1980 learning digital filters, how to implement the problem involved, and then looking at the multi-rate systems at a different sampling rate, and then nowadays designing multi-rate system, very complicated multi-rate system for, for efficiency as well as for, for, for speed. Okay. So, introduction to DSP. What is, the, what is DSP? If you look at very carefully, let's look at this system. This is an analog system. If I have an analog input signal, which is ST, which could be speed signal, it's a noise in it. What we do normally, if you know the noise is high frequency noise, we will use an analog low pass filter which would have a characteristic of frequency with amplitude, uh, looks like that. So if you have got noise in this region, that will be removed by the low pass filter. And then, uh, look at the output signal, will be almost the same as the analog signal. May not be exact. So that's what you do in analog uh, processing. But designing this filter for a simple first order is pretty good, easy. But if you want to design a filter like that, very sharp cut over like that, and it's, it's, it's challenging in analog domain. To get that transition of low pass filter is challenging because the, the, the filter has to be not first order, it could be, it's not second order, it could be 20th order. A 20th order analog filter is very hard to design because it becomes unstable. So people will design a second order, 10 second order cascaded one after another that will give you a 20th order, but still there's problems. So in this respect, a digital filter, if you convert this signal into digital, and a digital filter provides you a uh, kind of uh, remove this problem, and also it provides other, other advantages. So this is what uh, its processing means. If you want to do the same thing using digital signal processing, now the block is not simple one block, many blocks. Your input signal has to be low pass filtered first. This has to be low pass filter. It's an analog, we call it anti aliasing filter or analog pre filter, somebody calls it. Some people call it pre filter. And this is your cutoff frequency, SC cutoff frequency. And this filter is, this is a filter signal. So this is, if this max, maximum frequency, if, if C is equal to say 4 kilohertz, for example, then this uh, this component, this has got spectrum up to 4 kilohertz. Then we decide the sampling frequency, Fs, which is equal to 8 kilohertz. If it's 4 kilohertz. So we set up the ATD converter, what you have, which is operating in 8 kilohertz by knowing this filter is at 4 kilohertz, cutting it off. We can have the sam uh, ATD converter 8 kilohertz. Then this signal, what you're going to count, what's going to come out is samples like that. And this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And these are the samples. And the distance between these, T is equal to 1 over Fs, which is equal to 1 over 8,000. 
hertz, which is equal to 125 microseconds. That's what you will have. So that's your digital signal at that point. So you've got digital signal at that point there. And then the signal is processed, either using a low-pass filter, high-pass filter, band-pass filter, depends on the application. Then the process signal, which is the discrete signal here, SN, is passed to a D3 converter, which is a digital to analog converter. And when you pass through that, what you get there is like impulses like that. Like that. So it kind of like that you get it. These have to be joined to get analog signal. So you pass through the same low pass filter that you had here. And the low pass filter will join on these and give you a continuous signal. That's where your analog signal comes in. So if you look at it, so let me go back and tap it here for a second and get it up this. You can see from here, in order to get to a, this signal XT, which is SN plus noise, means this is the noise, and this is anti-aliasing filter to decide what your sampling frequency is. That's why you use for all guys. A to D converter, this is a processor, B to a converter, analog filter, or oh, oh, uh, sorry, it's a digital filter, and then. Um, Sorry, it's an analog filter. This is an analog filter. This is an also analog filter. And then you get the signal back. Okay? That is the structure that you have for a simple forcing of a digital signal. Now we look at each, each block. A to D converter converts the input signal into a digital form. B to A converter converts a forcer signal into analog form. The reconstruction filter, what is the reconstruction filter? Do you want to go back? This is the reconstruction filter. Same as this. This is digital to analog, digital, 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 right? This reconstruction filter smooths out the output of the D3 converter and removes unwanted frequencies. The analog input filter is used to band limit the analog input signal and uh, to reduce aliasing. We will come back to that later. That means if you signal this is frequency, this is amplitude, if my if this is my frequency spectrum up to say eight, eight kilohertz, you only want to four kilohertz, then what you will do, you will filter them like that to four kilohertz. So you need an analog filter because the signal here is analog, therefore it has to be analog filter. That's still analog. Then digital digital, then in and this is analog, and and this is also this is DJ converter is also analog, and then you get the signal back. DJ converter converts it to analog. Okay. So the heart of the system of the previous figure is your D DSP processor, which is where all the processing is done. Like for example, if you if you for example take a, a human processing, you analog signal comes in as a sound wave, converted with analog system is your is your ear is an analog spectrum analyzer, analyze the spectrum, and that spectrum is converted to digital information to the brain. Brain understands what has been said, and then it controls your vocal apparatus and moving the neuromuscular controllers, move them and then you start a speech and what, and as an analog. So analog goes in, process analog, digital process inside, and then digital thinking is translated to analog. So basically, the important part is the processor. Right, the processor is same as here. This is the important part. That's your brain, human brain. So that's the processor. So that's what I mentioned. So basically, the digital signal processor may implement one or several DSP algorithms, a simple filter algorithm, a low pass filter, which is taking the XN and providing output. So, for example, a simple low pass filter which we have done last week is A1 the minus 1, which is a low pass filter. You may be implementing that 
in the DSP processor, in the digital signal processor, that means you will implement y n is equal to x n plus a1 x n minus 1. That's the algorithm you'll be implementing in the processor and which process the signal. So before any DSP algorithm can be performed, you must convert the signal in digital form. I've already explained that. The process is called A to D conversion. But the signal must be for sample converting analog signal to discrete signal. So now we are going to talk about A to D converter. Can I go back to the diagram for a second? Here's the A to D converter. What is an A to D converter? What's the problem associated with A to D converter? We are going to convert an analog signal to a digital form. To do that, we will run into problems. This analog signal has to be band limited. If it's band limited, then you can decide to sample signals. So amplitude of each sample is quantized into one of the two B levels. You have already done before ATD convert in the second year. When you have analog signal coming, if you want to digitize them, you need to quantize them. Now, next slide shows that very clearly. Take here, for example, a practical representation of an ATD converter. And say, here is my analog signal. And inside the ATD converter, here is that whole thing is an ATD converter. Inside the ATD converter, you can switch. Which process, that's called the sampler. Which process is the switch? As soon as you close this, say at that time instant you closed it, for example, there. That amount of voltage is immediately pumped into the capacitor. And then you open up, immediately you open up. So what happened is that the capacitor here holds the charge belongs to that amplitude. See? And you are assuming the capacitor is not leaking in a way, low leakage capacitor. So this voltage, instantaneous voltage, is now being checked. Is the voltage force between these two levels? Or is it here? Or is it here? Or is it here? We don't know. Where it falls, we don't know. And you find where it falls. For example, if it falls there, you will see in this case how many levels you have? One, two, three, four. And you say, right, the signal that voltage you have is now going to be represented towards that level, fourth level, because it's closer to the fourth level. Or it's going to be represented at third level, because it's close to third level. But it has to be between third and fourth. This is level one, two, three, fourth level. So it's a basic, simple uh, uh, 4-bit quantizer. If you want 4 level, B becomes 2. So that 2 to the B is equal to 2 to the 2 is equal to 4 levels. So 4 levels are how do you represent 4 levels? You say 0, 0 is the first level, 0, 0. 0, 1 is the second level, 0, 1. 0, uh, uh, 1, 0 is the next level. Uh, 1, 0 is the next level. Then 1, 1. 1, 1 is the next level. So they are the four levels that you have. Right. Or you may have your zeros you're starting here, so everything pushed up. So if you want more levels, if you want less error, you must have more levels. You must have more bits. Okay? Once you have decided which level it is, then we provide the appropriate bit number. Whichever zero, this one or this one or this one or this one. That's the function of A to D converter. And then what happened? You can see here in this diagram, have you seen? At that point, I, I guess a sample where, I say for example, at that point they sampled. Once I close it, the voltage here is going to be constant. That's what it says, constant. Until you finish your coding, you're finding that level, or that level, or that level, or that. Once you have determined that, then you close it again. You close it again. And once you close it, either maybe that voltage now will be pumped in here. Discharge and pump it. So that's the voltage now. That has to be kept constant while you're figuring out what is your level. If you don't keep this capacitor constant while you're trying to figure out what level it falls, then you have a problem. So always during conversion, this conversion, this, sorry, during conversion, finding out which level it is, 
you must keep the voltage fixed. Let the first diagram be called the sample and hold quantizer encoder. The sample and hold, if you look at it, all it does is it decides, oh, I'm taking that voltage now. It holds that voltage while you are doing the conversion. Then I'm taking that voltage. During that level is maintained during the conversion. I'm taking that height. Voltage is maintained. So during conversion happening, the level is maintained. That means the voltage in the capacitor is not leaking away and kept there. And the switch which was closed to take, grab the voltage, now switch is open so the capacitor cannot um, discharge. This is an example of a sampling area. Just showing you the dotted lines are the analog signal. These are the samples that you are taking. The A to the output is these. And these are time instant N equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And these are the amplitude levels. It tells you what voltage it is. It will give you a bit pattern belongs to that voltage. It will give you a bit pattern belongs to that voltage. It will give you a bit pattern belongs to that voltage. So this is just sample data looks like this. Sample data are the data, this height, this height, this height, this height, this height. And if you join them, you get roughly an analog signal. Here is a 4-bit ATD converter. I've got a 4-bit, so 2 to the 4 will give you what? 16 levels all together. You've got a 16 levels all together. Now, we could have this converter, one, what we call it bipolar or unipolar. Unipolar means it's all, all positive voltage, all negative voltage. Bipolar means you have positive voltage and negative voltage. You can see that? So this level, 2 to the power 4, has to be now divided into, into regions. And I have here um, altogether starting from 0, 0. This level is called 0, 0, 0, 0. And then the first level is 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. This is the first level, this is the second level, third level, and so on. And then on the negative end of it, minus 1 is represented by that number, minus 2 is represented by that number, minus 5 is represented. And this is represented by using two complement arithmetic, which you have done used in, in microprocessors, 2041, elect 2041. And this is how. So if you've got a signal coming there, so if I have a signal moving there, and I sampled at that point, for example, I got that value, that would be represented by 0, 1, 0, 0. Okay. Quantization and encode, that's the second part. Before conversion into digital, the analog sample is assigned to one of the levels. This process is called quantization. What is quantization? Now, it introduces error. It's basically simple, without any diagram. Here is a signal analog signal. And here are my levels of digital levels. Here. That's my level. I sample at one time instant. Any time, this is, this is time, for example. At one, this is analog signal. Analog. I sampled and I found my signal was there. That's my sampling time instant. So, my difficulty is, Based on the level given, that's the number of bits I have, I cannot represent that. I can only represent that as the closest level, which is that. That means this is the value which will be selected for that particular level, not that value. That means this amplitude is not accurate. That means we have introduced error. Actual value is different because of I don't have enough levels, I have to approximate to one. That's called the quantization level. I'm trying to quantize the, uh, the signal, and I can't reach that level, therefore I push it to the nearest one, therefore if this particular sample has got error, which is called quantization error.
Now here is the example. Uh, uh, a three bit A to the inverted. That means two to the power three. Uh, uh, what is it? Two to the power three, which is eight levels. It's a unipolar. So everything starts from zero zero. There is zero zero one. Here is the first first well, the zero zero should be there as well. But that's the least significant that's the second bit and so on and so on. It just goes in. Encoder output. These are the levels. Okay, this is encoder output. It's not the bits like this is your this is your level. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight levels. Three bits. So here's my uh, analog signal, here's my analog signal. I sample at that point, sample at that point, sub point, sub point. So I've got I just go out of it. So what happened here? Let me push that sample. I can't have it there, I have to push it here. So my sample is now called that, which is one zero zero. That's the listing in a bit. This sample, I can't push it down, it has to be pushed up. It is closer to that. That will have a value four, so that is zero zero one. That's my bit. And when you count to this one, yes, that level, this one also pushed to that level, this one also pushed to that, that level. So it will be same value, this one, so that one, that one, so that one have same level. So this is what you output. For the analog signal, once you sample it like that, the output looks like this. This is a three bit code coming out. It's three bit, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, three bit is a code. So now we look at, we take a 12 bit ADD converter, is a bipolar converter, and the input voltage is range from plus 10 to minus 10. So, like, like that, minus 10 volts to plus 10 volts. So, I got roughly here 20 volts I have. And I got 12 bits, so the resolution is like you will have 2 to the power of 12 bits is your total number of um, levels. So you could say you're going to have the distance between these each level, what's the voltage in terms? You can say 20 volts is what I have. The number of levels is 2 to the power 12. Minus 1 is the number of intervals. If you've got 10 levels, you get 9 intervals. So intervals are 2 to the power 12 minus 1. So 4.9 millivolts approximately is the resolution. So this is 0 volts, that's 4.9 millivolts. This is, this is 2 times of 4.9 millivolts, and as, by the time you reach there, you'll get... Well, this is not 0, this is negative, but, but that's what it is, the, the resolution is 4.9. So here we have, I have got signal 2 to the power 12, I've got 496 levels. So I'm going to take any voltage between plus, minus 10 plus 10, Divided them into 4,096 4, levels, and each level, distance between these levels are called delta B, which is the resolution, which is equal to the distance between that, which is 20 volts, divided by the number of levels minus 1, which is 2 to the power 12, number of levels minus 1. That's the intervals. 10 levels mean 9 intervals between. And the first signal is will be represented as positive, highest positive value is that. And the negative value is, is, is represented by that. But it's not the highest value. Uh, is it the highest value? Uh, one point, yes, that is the highest. Uh, yep, 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 it's a negative value. Uh, in two complements, if this is one, it will be a negative value. If that's it. The most significant bit is positive, then it's a positive value. Now we need to learn about this quantization error. Have a look. Let's take level 1, level 2. This is called level N. This is called level N minus 1. Okay. So you can say, here's my signal, which is B. That's my signal. What am I going to do? Is it going to be this level or that level? So, if it is above the mid level, if it's just above the mid level, you push it to there. It is above that. 
about this, this is the mid level, sorry, this is the level, this is the mid level. Now let me start again, let me start again. Here are my levels, level n plus 1 is that, level n is that, level n minus 1 is that. Three levels I have shown. The distance between the levels is called delta v, which is the resolution. And if you take the center point of the level, that will be delta v over 2. Now, the error is how much? If this signal is below the mid level, so we will push it to that level. So, you will find that the, the quantization error is going to be one half of the least significant bit. So, one half of the resolution, which is 4.9 millimeters the resolution divided by 2 is 2.45 millivolts different. If the sampling instant was there, there is no error. If the sampling instant was here, there is going to be error. If, it, if you get into the sample at that point, there, it will be pushed there. Whatever it is, you're going to have 2.45 milli, millivolts of error in That is called the quantization error. You cannot have exact value because you don't have enough level. If you want enough level, you increase the number of bits to, instead of 12, you have 12 bits, you go for 24 bits. Very nice level, you can, very, little, very less error, very small error. But the problem is to convert a signal into 24 bits of stream, every signal takes a long time. So ATD, ATD converter becomes very slow. So you have to compromise. Can you accept certain amount of error? If you say yes, then you can use a fast ADD converter, which will convert them very quickly with a few number of levels. Can I say few, 1,000 or 500 or etc. So for an A to D converter, binary digit number, we call the level star 2 to the power B, and the quantization structure is delta B, and delta B is equal to the total voltage swing divided by 2 to the B minus 1. When B is very much greater than 1, right, that means 10, 8, this can be approximated 2 to the power B. If, it is that, if this is like, if B is equal to 12, 2 to the power B is going to be uh, 4,096, is it, or 2,048? 2,048. In that case, 2,048 minus 1 or 2,048 are roughly the same. So you can approximate a 2,000 B if B is large. If B is small, you can't do that because if B is 2, 4 minus 1 is 3. That's a big error. So you can only approximate if B is very big. Number of bits, number of bits you use is very big. So basically, you're saying that the full-scale voltage of the ATD converter with the bipolar signal, the maximum polarization error. So in the case of worst scenario, if values are rounded up or down, remember I told you, it can go up or it can go down. Uh, let's take a sine wave input of amplitude A, so that's A, and then the total amplitude will become 2A. So let's calculate the quantization size. Delta V is 2A, is the amplitude divided by 2 to the power V minus 1. But we don't need to use the minus 1 because V will be a large, large number. So it will be approximately 2 to the V. We can actually show that we know, we have explained that the quantization error can be half, half the level. This is delta V, that's the level resolution. So quantization error can be delta V over 2. So we can say E, quantization error E, is plus or minus delta V over 2. It could be up or down. And, uh, and you can, we can actually show, if you look at this quantization error, for every sample, unless it falls in the correct level, there will be an error. And if you just actually calculate the error and look at the distribution, and you will find is random and is uniformly distributed in the interval of plus or minus delta V over 2 with a zero mean, okay? Uh, for us, the error is like in the distribution, it will be plus or minus delta V over 2, but for us, when you're talking on error, 
if it's here, it will be there, or it will be here, it will be there. The maximum is delta V over 2. That's an absolute error we can have. So the quantization noise power, or the variance, is given by the actual amplitude and my quantization amplitude. So you take the actual amplitude and find out the quantization amplitude. That gives you the error E. That's the E. And that's the E which can be between plus or minus delta V over 2. Correct? Then we need to calculate the quantization, the, the power, which is rho E squared. And we need to know the probability density function. You don't need to um, work out this yourself. But we can actually do this one by integrating, and we can show that uh, by knowing the probability um, density function for a uniformly distributed um, uh, uniform distribution, we can show that delta E squared is, uh, sorry, uh, the error squared is equal to delta V squared over 12. That's only true for uniform quantization. That means the levels are equal levels. And you will have learned in telecommunications, in telecom applications, these quantization levels are not equal. But in this case, we are assuming delta V is there. So the noise power is given by delta V squared over 12. Noise power is given by delta V squared. So we are assuming that all steps are equal size. You do not need to prove this at all. Normally, this is given to you, right? So if I use that as an example, and for a sine wave of input, I can say the signal power is basically the RMS power, which is A over root 2 is, is the uh, uh, RMS value, and its power is A squared over 2, and which you have done in for a sine wave from your electrical engineering subject, the RMS power calculation. So if you work out the signal, this is your signal power, to the quantization noise power, which we have already calculated and shown you, you will find signal to quantization noise ratio is 10 log signal power divided by the quantization uh, noise power. And for delta V, you have already said delta V is equal to what? Is uh, 2A is the amplitude for a sine wave, and 2 to the power of V is the number of bits. So you put the roll in here and square them all. And cancel out what you want to do, you end up with 10 log this equation. And this can be simplified. If you, if you, you can simplify this. If you simplify this, you get signal to quantization noise ratio. If you simplify this, you get signal to quantization ratio is equal to, working out this is 6.42 times the number of bits plus 1.76 in dB. This is converted already in dB. This is the power ratio in converting 10 log. So you can simplify. If you have a problem on this, how to do this, you can ask in the tutorial class, but this is the equation you get. So signal to quantization noise. So the less quantization noise is better. You have signal to quantization noise. So like the quantization noise has to be very small. You want to keep very, very small if you can. That means you have to increase the number of bits. The levels have to be small enough, very, very small. You can't have that sort of level. You want very fine levels. If you have got like that, then if the signal falls in anywhere here, the, 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 the quantization is going to be very, very small. And we will see, like from here onwards, we do calculation and show you, using that formula, if we use number three bits, that's to the power 3, which is 8 levels, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 levels, your signal to point is 18 dB. And if you use 4 levels, which is sorry, 4 bits, which is 16 levels, it's 25 dB. And then, and so on, and we put 7 levels, 7 bits, 128 levels, 43 dB. So you can see that every time you increase a bit by 1 bit at a time, you can say the signal to quantization noise ratio is by approximately 60 dB. 60 dB approximate. This is 60 dB approximate. So, if you have got 8, eight, um, eight um, uh, bits, you can say signal to quantization noise ratio is uh, 8 times, so uh, 6 is 48. So, 48 dB is the best. So, you can say thus 
significant quantization noise ratio increases approximately 60 bit for each bit, every bit. So if you've got 12 bits, is your ADD converter, your signal to quantization noise ratio is 12 times approximately 6 is about 72 dB approximately. 73 you will get roughly. So if you take the, uh, um, the compact disc CD or the music CD, is 14 bits you have altogether there. So the signal to quantization noise ratio is 14 times the 6, which is Is it 84? Oh, I can't even multiply. <laughs> it's 84 dB. 84 dB there. So like it's about 80, 80, 85 dB, I think. Am I right? Yeah. 72, 80, uh, 80, uh, 78, and 84 dB. That's correct. So 84 dB signal to point station ratio is high quality. So as it goes up and up, number of bits increases, the quality increases. But you will find with a four, uh, 14 dB in a, in a compact uh, CD um, uh, uh, a sample representation, the quality is extremely high. You don't need to go anything further than that. Right. So basically, let's come back here, like we say, right summary. We have got signal, analog signal coming in. It's 0 to 5 volts, so it's a unipolar, it's not a bipolar. 12 bit AC converter, and you've got 12 bits comes from every sound. So what is your step size of resolution? It's 5 volt, which is here, divided by 2 to the power 12 minus 1. That's your, and you normally have a conversion time of, say for example, 35 microseconds, or you've got faster than that. That means, conversion time means, what's the time, this, if your signal is there, that's your first sample, that's your second sample. This is your sample in the T. It's got one over it. So, what is conversion time is always is, as soon as it samples, it takes so long, it sample and hold holds it that long, and during that time, the conversion is happening. That's the time interval. But so, we have to make sure our conversion time is always less than the sample period. As long as that's okay. So, you have to select as ATD converter which is uh, fast enough so the conversion is happening less than sampling period. So if you are sampling at one microsecond, so if you are sampling in this is equal to one microsecond, then your, your ATD converter has to be less than that. It should be about 0 0.6 microsecond, 0 0.5 microsecond sampling. So it, it, you need to make sure that uh, the ATD converter is faster. If you are sampling at every 500 microseconds, then you can get a very slow ATD converter, which goes conversion is every 250 microseconds. So every 500 you are sampling, first sample, second sample, 500. So ATD has, can take a long time. So it's cheaper. Low sampling rate ATDs are cheaper. And a few other things. You will learn all these in your electronics course, but just to give you a couple of other parameters, when you are dealing with sample and hold, you've got an aperture time of 25 nanoseconds and an acquisition time of 2 microseconds, for example. Then uh, we have to calculate what is at what sampling frequency you can sample an ATD converter, uh, what's the maximum. So sampling is depends on your 35 microseconds of conversion time plus, plus the 2 microseconds of acquisition time plus the, plus the um, aperture time and uh, 27 kilohertz. So, so your sampling is, so to make sure your sampling frequency is well over uh, uh, 20, 27 kilohertz. Because this amount you need um, to do all the conversion, so you have to sample it faster than, uh, like not faster, slower than that. So if, 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 you are, if you are sampling at 27, if your conversion takes 27 kilohertz, that means one over 20 seconds, uh, so many microseconds, and that means 35, 37 microseconds it takes uh, to do the conversion, you need to have your sampling is about 40, 45 microseconds. Okay. Hope you've understood that. If you don't have, you can ask us again, but you will be learning this electronics as well.
Now we are going to look at sampling of analog signals. We are really going to go through the sampling uh, theorem and, and the problems involved and the aliasing. Let's take a signal, XP, is sampled at every T second. That means we have learned earlier, the digital signal is equal to XT at T equal to NT. That has to be done. T is equal to NT. We have done that. So if this is your analog signal, your analog spectrum is X omega. This should be capital X, not small x. There are others there. And if small x then, then it's X theta. That's for digital spectrum. We looked at it before. And this way to be converted sampling and one over T is the sampling period. Theta is related to analog signal omega, omega by the sampling period. That's equal to two pi F A. Omega is equal to two pi F A and F A over F S. That's your digital frequency. So when you are dealing with uh, analog signal and digital signal, analog signal means your frequency is omega which goes from what? Omega is goes to plus infinity, plus infinity, and it goes to this direction, minus infinity. When you are plotting the graph, you, you got frequency is, uh, like for example, a frequency response could be like that, is going to be plus infinity and minus infinity. When you are dealing with analog, a digital signal, digital signal, when you are plotting the frequency response, you will be only plotting between plus pi, and minus pi. We'll come back to that in a minute. Okay? So, we haven't done the Fourier transform chapters yet. We haven't come across that yet. We will be doing that soon. That is the Fourier transform chapter in your, in your signal processing part B, and that's the chapter 2. That chapter 1 is the transform, chapter 2 is Fourier transform. That's in part B, right? Let's Run through them, assuming that you have done in the second year, let's look at it. If you have an analog signal XT, and this, if you want to get the analog signal from a Fourier transform, this is the formula you use, which is called the inverse Fourier transform. And for digital signal also, what we do, we can obtain the discrete time signal. How do you get this key type of signal? You substitute T for the NT. So you go in here, and wherever T is substitute NT there, and I'm going to derive a formula from your analog Fourier transform into digital format. So this is your equation now. You get new equation. Have you got it? Inverse Fourier transform means if you are given Fourier transform of a signal, which is a complex number x omega, that's the frequency response. From that, by evaluating this integral, you get your uh, analog signal back, or this continuous time signal back. If you take that equation and substitute t for the nt, you get discrete time signal and an equation for that as well. These two are now related. So let's rewrite that equation, and we just could do some der derivation. So I got that equation. And I write this, this one. Now I replace T by NT. You will find E to the J N omega T. E to the J N omega T is a cosine function. If you look at this one, this will be cos N omega T plus J of J sine N omega T, T small t, small t as a Oh, um, sorry, you don't need to see the digital. Sorry, sorry, sorry. And rewrite this again. N is your sample number. So it's the uh, cos uh, omega t, omega capital T, cos omega capital T, and N plus J psi omega capital T N. That's your equation. You can see that has got a period of 2 pi. That also has got a period of 2 pi. So we know this function has got a period of 2 pi. So I can need now rewrite this equation as xn equal to, the same thing equal to, go back and say, right, let me take a, where's 2 pi? There's 2 pi here. Okay. I'm now going to 
this is minus infinity plus infinity. I'm not going to use minus infinity plus infinity. I'm not going to say, okay, this is repeating. So let me go from integral 2k pi plus 2k pi plus pi another minus pi and x omega j omega n t that's already there, right? Okay. And I want to convert this omega. I want to multiply by t and then divide by t. So that's what I did. I just put a t there and divide by t. And we just keep it like that. When you do that, you bring this 1 over t outside. So you've got 1 over t here, and this one still remains, and minus pi to plus pi. 2k pi plus pi is, you're coming back to the same point in, 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 the, in, in the quadrant. So that means it can be written as minus pi to plus pi. So this summation tells you, this summation tells you, you take the fundamental region and keep adding them because this is, this is periodic, you should get your signal. So what I'm going to do, the next step is, if you have a look, I have moved this one in here. I have replaced that one by plus pi and a minus pi, which is fine. And because I, re I, I replaced that, I now going to add on omega k, that k, and 2 pi, 2 pi over t. Because this is an omega, and you can't keep this in, in, in that form, so you want to take in the radians, you divide by t. Alright? And then, if you do the same thing, because you are removing that, you will have to do the same thing here, omega plus k, 2 pi over t, n g. So that's your new equation. Now, if you do further, and if you continue that, what will happen is, here, if you go, go further, you still keep that, you still keep this one, uh, this one, you still keep that, and you still have this one, and there is something missing. Do you want to look at your election on this? The, the, the summation part is missing. Can you go back and look at the lecture notes? Let me go back here. So if you come back, what's happening is that he left out the summation. The summation should have been here. This one should have been here. It has been left out. E to the jk 2 pi nt is coming back to the same point. It's equal to e to the j omega nt. So basically what you have done is basically you have got rid of these by introducing this. And wherever omega you're going to introduce that one. And then using the formula that e to the j is exactly the same as that, and you've got your signal this one back. So the integral, their summation is missing here. Now you switch around the summation and the integral. If you go back again, you switch around the summation and the integral. You bring your integral outside and put in the summation. Look at your lecture notes. And this part is on its own, let me go back again, just show you there. That is, I am moving this summation inside and this one outside. That's what I'm going to do. And then omega t, omega t is divided as theta. You know that? So wherever omega t, you're going to replace them by theta. So if you do that, go back again. Oh, good. And you will find there is t theta is equal to omega theta. This theta is omega t. And you get this bit, which we defined as our Fourier transform of the signal, of the discrete time signal. This is the Fourier transform of the discrete time signal. So from here, we are going to show that xn is equal to 1 over 2 pi minus pi to plus pi. This part is our x theta. Okay, can I just pop this out? I made a mistake. Not a mistake, but just that part we are representing at x theta. And 
एक्सटी पे काम से नहीं है एंड दिस इज आवर इनवर्स फोर ये ट्रांसफॉर्म दिस इज द डेफिनेशन ऑफ इनवर्स फोर ये ट्रांसफॉर्म But when you are trying to define this, you find x theta is a is a um, uh, Fourier transform of the discrete time signal, which is called uh, discrete time Fourier transform. X theta, x theta is called x omega plus k two pi over t. What does what does that mean? Okay, you say x theta is equal to x omega plus k. 2 pi over t. So if you put k equal to 1, you get x. Like k equal to 0, just say k equal to 0. You get x omega plus k equal to 1. X omega plus 2 pi over t. What does that mean? When k equal to 0, your x omega is exactly same as x theta is exactly same as x omega. K equal to one mean outside the sampling period minus pi to plus pi. You repeat the spectrum again. So basically, this tells you your x omega is repeated at every two pi over t. So x x omega has the fundamental region of minus pi to plus pi, and outside the region it will repeat. So that's what it says. Minus pi to plus pi is the region. Outside the region, it will repeat. So, if you want to go and look at that, it is seen that x t x theta is periodic in the period of two pi. So, the digital spectrum is a repetition of an analog spectrum. What does that mean? Is x theta you got is equal to we said x omega plus two pi over t times k. That's what we have. What does that mean? Is When k equal to zero, x theta, your digital spectrum is equal to analog spectrum. In the region, theta less than equal to pi, less than equal to minus pi. And then k equal to one, what happened? X theta now becomes x omega plus k one. In this case, two pi over t. That means your x omega shifted. So other side is it centered around two pi over t now, and when you go next one it centers around three pi over t and so on. So the the digital spectrum after sampling is same as the analog spectrum in a particular region. After that the same analog spectrum repeats. That's what the theory is. The proof I have done earlier it it takes some time for you to sit down and go through the variables. Just run through the variables again. And look at the book notes. If you're not sure about it, I can run through that in the class again. Okay. So, what is aliasing? Right. Now we come to the point of aliasing. The figure explains the aliasing. X theta and the analog spectrum. In this case, x omega is zero. Analog spectrum is zero when omega is greater than pi over t. And what does that mean? Okay, let's go next next line. Here is the signal. Okay, case one. X omega is zero when omega is greater than pi over t. That's the point pi over t. That's the pi over t. And if you work out what does pi over t mean, pi over t. Right. So we know F S is equal to One over t, uh, right? So you can say that uh, um, this this can be written as pi times of f s. You can write that, okay? Um, or we can we can work it out and show this is equal to f s over two, half the sampling frequency. How do you do that? You can come back here. Our relationship is theta equal to omega t. Right, that's our relationship, and theta equal to omega t. So if you want to have omega at that point at f s over two, if you want to have omega at f s over two, that is two pi f s 
over 2. That's what you want to have. Times t. What does that mean is these two cancel out. And f, that's pi times. fs is 1 over t. Times t, they cancel out. And you get pi. So pi is your radiance. And if you want to convert the radiance, uh, sorry, pi is the, uh, if you want to convert that into frequency, you divide by t, all right? Pi is in radiance, and if you want that into uh, frequency, you divide by t, so you get omega, right? So, so your analog spectrum is band limited to half the sample, fs over 2. Remember we learned earlier, uh, as theorem, if your signal is sampled at fs, your signal, ha if you your spectrum has to be limited to half the sampling. That's what I've done. If you do that, that's the analog spectrum. When you sample it, the analog signal, you get your digital signal, x theta. Its amplitude, A, will come as A over T. Don't forget that. When you do the sampling, the amplitude, the gain is reduced. You want to have a look at that. Why? You go back here. Can you see here your analog signal? spectrum is amplitude divided by 1 over t. If you are, if you only are looking at that spectrum, its amplitude will be reduced. But if you are adding everything together, then you have the correct spectrum. If you are only looking at one of them. So, at the moment, the, the, the problem is, what are we trying to do? We are trying to say, if you have an analog spectrum, it will repeat in the digital domain. How does it repeat? Okay. If you look at this diagram, it shows you. This tells you the repetition. You go into this diagram and look at the diagram here. So, analog, according to our equation, you say x theta, what did we get? Equal to x omega plus 2 pi over t k. That's what we have, remember? So, x omega is this one. So k equal to zero, that one is that. That's k equal to zero. K equal to one, if you put k equal to one, this will be the part, k equal to one, this one. K equal to minus one, this is the part, k equal to minus one. So what this equation tells is, your digital spectrum will have your original spectrum exactly copied here, in the region of pi to minus pi, which corresponds to fs over 2 or minus fs over 2. And then the remaining one is the repetition of the original spectrum here and here. So when you are drawing digital spectrum, when you are drawing digital spectrum, you must make sure your analog spectrum is repeated. And quite a lot of you find it difficult to understand this because it, the very first time it's not clear. So you go back again, first thing you have to do is first find out what is theta, where is the axis theta? This is, um, this is not omega, this is digital spectrum, so I must change this to theta. This is theta, digital spectrum. This is analog spectrum, okay. First thing you have to know is if your analog spectrum value A, this should be A over T. That's the first thing you need to know. Then. This is normally magnitude, and this is also magnitude. That's the way you should draw, right? Your analog spectrum will copy into the digital spectrum in the fundamental region where you are. What are these points corresponds to? A pi corresponds to half the sampling period. Then, when k equal to 1, this spectrum will repeat. And that spectrum will repeat this side, and will repeat again, and so on, go up to the infinity. If you look at the summation, it goes up to the infinity. So normally when you draw a digital spectrum, you only draw that part only. That's all you draw, that region. That's called the fundamental region. Theta is less than or equal to pi, greater than or equal to minus pi. That's all you draw. You don't draw this part at all. Because we know it's going to repeat. But you will find this part will interfere with this if you did not properly filter it. If you didn't filter it, what will happen? See, if you didn't filter properly, this will go like that, that will go like that. This will now go like this, 
and this will go like this. And what happens is, here is a region of fundamental spectrum interacting with this spectrum, and find what will happen is, the spectrum will be modified like that. So your modified spectrum will look like that. That means your coarse distortion. That means you must make sure if you are sampling at FS, which is 8 kilohertz, your original signal has to be limited to 4 kilohertz. That means at 4 kilohertz you get a zero spectrum. Zero value, magnitude value, not spectrum, magnitude value, 4 kilohertz. Anything above 4 kilohertz, you're okay. Anything after 4 kilohertz, you'll be always zero. If you have that, then there's no problem, you can sample at 8 kilohertz. If you don't have it, and if you make it further here, and sample at the wrong sampling, then this distortion will occur. That distortion is called the aliasing. That is aliasing distortion. Let's look at the second case where So in the first case, you're saying the digital spectrum is the same as the original analog spectrum and repeats at multiples of the sampling frequency of 2 pi over 2 pi over t is always sampling frequency. You will find that as a sampling frequency because you can see this is if you if you if you convert if you work it out, you cross multiply this one, this will become two pi. So 2 pi, pi is half the sampling frequency, 2 pi is actual sampling frequency. So that's why I say pi is half the sampling frequency. And move on to the next one. Here is a case where x omega is not equal to 0. I should have had, that's what I should have had. You see? That's what I should have had. Because I'm going to sample, this is, this is, Fs over 2. And I'm going to sample at Fs is my sampling frequency. So I must have had this. But I didn't have it. I didn't pre-filter it properly. I left the uh, energy content of the input signal to go. I didn't sample it right. So in that case, what happened? This is your, this is your new waveform. Now, that's your new one. And you've got extra energy coming in. So if you draw it, that will be here. And this spectrum repeats at 2 pi, at minus 2 pi, which is the sampling frequency. This is Fs. This is Fs over 2. This part here, so these two interact. When you interact, this one, this one cancel out, or that one, that one cancel out, you get a flat. That's called. Basically, you can see that. This one and this one will cancel out, and you get a flat response. And, uh, and this is trying to bring it here, this is trying to bring it this way, so the cancel out and your flat response. So, you are expecting to have that completely, but you won't have it. You will have that much, and then flattening. So this is distortion. That distortion is called, this part is called alias, alias. This is the part called alias. So, if you do not band limit the signal properly, and sample them, then you will cause distortion in your spectrum. That means when you reconstruct the signal, you will hear it. So this is called alias. And that's what I'm explaining that here. The sampling frequency is not sufficiently high. The spectrum centered around on FS will fold over alias into the baseband frequencies. Base band frequency is minus pi to plus pi. So it, it must be, you must look at and see in the diagram that this one will fold over here. And this one fold over here. Because this is the, our fundamental region, minus pi to plus pi. And it folds over. As soon as this folds over, this will interact here and cause distortion. So if you want to avoid, you want to make sure the spectrum stops at pi over t. It must stop here. So you must have a filter filtering out like that. So Russell's uh, fam familiar with the sampling uh, theorem, it says that that you must 
hold the nitrous frequency principle. If you don't have, if you don't follow the nitrous frequency, the sampling theorem follows the nitrous uh, uh, frequency, uh, and then then you are you you are into trouble. So minimum sampling frequency uh, 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 should be twice the maximum frequency content available in the signal. That's the minimum sampling frequency. Otherwise, you go to the so if you are asked to draw aliasing diagram, this is how you draw. So it should be noted that even if X omega is not strictly band limited, then that is some negligible energy outside pi over T is equal to what? Yes, that's over two. Remember that. And there will be overlap in the equation and uh, and that is important when sampling frequency is to be selected in a particular signal. So you must decide in advance what you can select, what's your sampling frequency before you go any further. So, you must remember that one of the things that you really have to remember is, here's my signal, and if I draw it again, two things you have to remember. First one you have to remember, what is, this is the formula we use, omega t is equal to theta, correct, that's the digital frequency, this is analog, this is digital. So if your omega is, you can say, 2 pi f analog frequency t equal to theta. You can say that. And if you say your analog frequency is fs over 2, then you say 2 pi fs over 2 times t equal to theta. That means 2 and 2 cancel out. and uh, this T and Fs cancel out because Fs is 1 over T, so they cancel out. So theta becomes pi. That means theta equal to pi means your frequency, analog frequency is Fs over 2. So in this formula, by substituting the, the corresponding values, you can find the theta. If you, want to, if you want to substitute theta equal to omega T, right, and that says 2 pi Fs, uh, Fa, C, or you can say 2 pi Fa over Fs. And you say uh, my analog frequency is equal to the sampling frequency, so that's equal to 2 pi Fs over Fs, that's the cancel, so sampling frequency equals from 2, 2 pi. So from now onwards you should know in the analog domain Fs corresponds to 2 pi in the digital domain, and fs over 2 corresponds to pi in the digital domain. So when you are drawing axis, you say that's my axis, that's my fs over 2, and that's my fs in digital domain, that will be pi, that will be 2 pi. Okay? So make sure that you got familiarized with that when you are drawing digital spectrum and analog spectrum. You must know that very, very clearly. Let me go back again once more, just to make sure here that if you have a spectrum, let me take a spectrum here, I can draw another spectral diagram. This is X omega. I'm going to take a number now. I'm going to say that is my spectrum, input spectrum. And I was told this point is two kilohertz. I was told that's 2 kilohertz and that's minus 2 kilohertz. And what must be my sampling frequency? Your Fs has to be greater than or equal to 4 kilohertz. So that your digital frequency will be there, there, and this is pi, this is minus pi, this is Fs over 2, which is equal to 2. This is Fs over 2, which is equal to 2, minus 2, minus, right? So that the next one is based on 2 pi, next image is like that, will not interfere. If you select this to 3, for example, if you select this to 3 kilohertz, which is wrong, what will happen? The 3 will be here, so you will have a signal like that. It will start interfere with the fundamental spectrum. This is the fundamental region, minus 
and you will cause distortion. So, if you don't select the sampling frequency correct, you cause alias. If you are not sure about it, still understanding the analog frequency, digital frequency, half the sampling frequency, sampling frequency, aliasing problems, and repetition of the spectrum, fundamental region, if you're not sure about it, ask us in the, uh, in the tutorial, or just come around and talk to me, okay? Next part, we have done A to D conversion, and we have looked at the spectrum. The next part is digital to analog conversion. In order to understand this, you need to know four years transform, which we haven't done yet. which we have not done fully yet, it's, it's, as I said to you, it comes in part B, chapter 2. But let's look at, let's look at, let me explain, later on you can revisit this. D to a conversion process employed to convert a digital signal into analog form after you process them. And you then feed the analog signal into, into, into a speaker or sound alarm or whatever the way you do. So let me show the D to A process on the next figure and see how the D to A process works. Let's go and look at it. Here's the digital signal process. Go back and look at your diagram. The digital signal process gives either 8 bits or 12 bits or 12, whatever the A to D converter decided originally. And this is what you feed into the D to A converter. What would you get out of it? Well. This is what you have feeding one sample there, 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 equal sampling period. But what's coming out of here is D to A converter. As soon as you feed a signal, it will remain constant for some time. And then you feed the next signal, remain for that long. And then next signal remain that long. This distance is your sampling period. So D to A converter there. Yeah. You've got a D to A converter. You put a pulse there, and the output goes up and stays there. How long? Until you get the next pulse, which is that high, and stays there. Until you get the next one, it then goes up further, or down, or depends on. And that's how you get. This is look like a kind of receipt. This looks like a staircase. So the output of a D to a converter is a staircase output. And that's not good, good enough for us. Because we want analog signal, we say D to A converter. So what we need is we need to follow this path. We need to smooth out like this. Instead, to do that, you pass the signal through a low pass filter, which will join all these points and smoothly give you an analog signal. This low pass filter bandwidth is exactly the same as the bandwidth of the pre filter. If your pre filter bandwidth is 0 to 4 kilohertz, then your low pass filter here, all to 0 to 4 kilohertz. That's exactly what you need. So you must have a, after processing the signal, D to A converter and a low pass filter. It's very important for you to have that. This particular D to A that we have shown is called zero hold or hold. It just holds the value. So what I've explained is already explained here that the output approximates the analog, in, analog signal uh, by a rectangular pulses. So we get rectangular pulses. So we've got analog signal like that. You get rectangular pulses like that. Like, like that one, you can, because this is your height, height of the signal. Okay. Now let's understand. Try to look at the theory. What does that mean? Height mean? How does it join? So somebody could ask me, all right, you said to me that this is the pulses, this is like that, and then that comes in, and the step case, staircase, 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 like that. How does it join these when you pass the low pass filter? Let me take one of the pulses of the output of the DTA converter and analyze them. What is this pulse? What does that do? Okay. 
So HP, I'm going to say is 1, it could be any amplitude, I say 1, there at that central level, up to the sampling PPM. The next level is up there, I'm not worried about it for the moment, I'm just saying it's up to the level and it will be 0 afterwards. So I'm taking one rectangular pulse out of the DTA converter, the first sample comes out a pulse, I'm taking that one. And if I take that, uh, that's in time domain. See? If you take the four examples of that, which you will learn, and I think I have shown you here, maybe I shouldn't need to, the four examples formula, H omega is analog signal goes from minus into the plus into the H C is the signal, and E to the G omega is D C. And if you look at the signal back, is C is the period. It's going to repeat this, or the, the pulse with this T. See, it's not repeating it, sorry, it's pulse with this T. So if you go, you're going to indicate from 0 to T, because all the other places, 0 and T, and this is all 0, so I don't need, I indicate there. So HT is now become equal to 1, so I have that bit in here, and you indicate that, and that's where you get. Now you substitute 0 or T, and we have that, that's where you get now. What you do in this case, you take half of this out of the as a common, you take half of that, you must put plus minus half if you take, you must have a plus half there, so that when you multiply this in, you'll get this one back, one back, and then bring this minus to your underneath, right, and I can now simplify this algebra that e to the g omega t over 2 here, minus e to the minus g omega t over 2, that's minus missing, divided by this angle j omega t over 2. So I introduced, I, I didn't have, I had a j omega, but I did not have a t over 2, so I put a t over 2 and multiply by uh, t over 2 here as well. I put a t over 2 and I, um, is that correct? I had j omega. Yes, that's correct. I, I need to, I am multiplied by t over 2 because I want that here. So now I can write this whole thing as sine omega t over 2, that is that bit, divided by omega t over 2. It's like a formula sine theta over theta. That's what I'm trying to manipulate. And you all know this is sine, isn't that right? Remember I have done that earlier? So you will find this is your magnitude part, this is your phase. So go to the next equation, and if you plot the equation, that this one, if you take the magnitude of it, so you've got h omega, you've got h omega is equal to, what you are getting is t over 2 sine omega t over 2, divided by omega t over 2 times e to the power minus j, uh, j, j omega t over j omega t over 2. Now if you take the modulus of h omega, we do that, modulus of e to the power is 1, so you take the modulus of that. And that's what I have plotted with the magnitude. If you look at the magnitude, I take the modulus and you see my amplitude is t over 2 because you've got sine omega t over 2 divided by, I think, yeah, omega t over 2 divided by what? Omega t over 2. Uh, we've got sine omega t over 2 divided by omega t over 2 over t over 2. So at omega equal to 0, what happens? Sine theta over theta, sine theta over theta at theta equal to 0 or equal to 1, this become 1, right? So this is 1, so the magnitude of t. So at omega equal to 0, I got a magnitude of t over 2. And then you go and look at its position where it goes to 0, at 2 pi over t equals 0, 4 pi over t equals 0, 6 pi over t equals 0, like that. It's the magnitude. It's the sine fun uh, function, it's function. Uh, sine theta or theta function behaves like that. You can see that? This is the frequency spectrum. 
And now you could say, oh, right, if that's the space and spectrum, and if you look at it, what will happen is, if this was your input to the D2A converter, so you have your D2A converter come here, D2A, and this is your signal, y, Yn you are giving here, and signal, and if you look at its spectrum, if I put the spectrum there like that, nice spectrum, fair. For example, this is an example. And because the output of a D2A converter has got this function, that like, you know, that thing function in there. Sorry, output of that, not that function, it's this function. Can I, can I rub it out? So the output has got this thing function effect. There you are. So what will happen is if the output is this effect is going to shape this signal. It can shape it such that it will come like that. So you're going to have a kind of a distortion in the D to A converter output. We need to remove that. So people know that sine x over x, the shape shaping of the DTA converter. So what people do is when you get Yn, before you pass to the DTA converter, you pass to X over sine X first and pass to the DTA converter. So what you do is DTA converter is going to give you sine X over X effect. You have already uh, given X over sine X, so they two cancel out. So what you really have, you got to really get. So the effect of a D2A converter is a shaping the spectrum can be removed by multiplying x over sine x in advance. That's exactly what I'm saying that the amplitude of the output signal spectrum multiplied by sine over x function which acts like a low pass filter with a high frequency attenuator. So this effect is due to the holding action of the heat rate converter and the signal recovery introduced in the amplitude distortion. So what do we do for this? Uh, what do we do is, oh. so what, what do we have to do the, is to, is to uh, I'm just looking at it. Yes, exactly. Can I go next? Slide to show you this. Uh, what you have to do is that you must make sure that this effect is removed. It's a low pass effect because you have got a pulse like that, which we have shown. If, if, you, if, you, if you work out its, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, impulse response, um, uh, if you look at its frequency response, it's a thing sound. Okay. And it's a, it, it, that effect has to be removed, so you multiply by uh, that over that. That's one example. Uh, let me go through this last couple of slides again. This one one slide missing, so there's some problem. Give me a second. Uh, this is the part I just want to run through that again. As I mentioned to you, if you have a D2A converter, that the D2A converter output, like when you give pulses like that to D2A, the output of the D2A converter, as I should say to you, comes like that, and like that stays, and then stays like that, and like that, stays like that, and so on. These are, and you need a smoothing filter to smooth it out. Now, if you take this uh, part alone and find out it's, uh, it's, uh, it's um, mm, um, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, it's, uh, it's frequency response, if you take that as false, we, we knew it's called the sine shaping like that. And so all we are saying is that if you've got a one pulse at this T is your pulse width, then the first zero appears here. Really, we should avoid this, this shaping. 
if you can avoid it, it will be great. Uh, the best way to avoid is to have your signal wire coming in here, and then you pass it through 6 over sine x, and then pass it through your uh, D2A converter, and then this, this effect will cancel out this. That's perfect. But quite a lot of people don't do that. What they tend to do is, because to multiply all this is difficult, and what they do in a DK converter, you look at your signal and then say, all oh, right, this is what we have, the pulse comes in, and then the next pulse comes in, and so on, and this is T. So if you reduce the T, if you reduce the T sampling, keep the sampling period fixed. You can make, if this is made small, this will come like that. So that means you will not shape your spectrum. So what you could do is in D3 converter, if you don't understand fully, not to worry at this stage, because the first time I'm introducing it, you may find what you do in a D3 converter, D2 converter comes in, you give your pulse like that, and then you hold the pulse for some time, and then make it zero. Then you make and hold it zero, and so on. That's what you do for your D2 converter. If you do that, you will get the shaping. Okay. But instead of doing this, this x over sine x is the best solution. Okay, to appreciate that. This is the problem always with the D2A converter. A2A, A2D converter has got a quantization noise problem that can be avoided by increasing the number of levels. Then we have got a problem of sampling. If you take the wrong sampling frequency, then you cause distortion in the signal. Once you have avoided all those, you process the signal, then when you come to D2A, you've got this D2A problem because it has got the shaping, output spectrum is shaped. So to avoid that, at the output of the D2, at the input of the D2 converter, you can do this, or you multiply by x over sine x shaping, and then D2 converter, and the D2 provides sine x over x this, this to cancel out, you get your signal nicely back. One more interpretation I want you to know, you can read this through, is, uh, can I just go through? This is what the next part. The reconstruction filter. Remember, I just showed you. You get that amplitude, then that, and so on. Then you have to have a reconstruction filter at the D to A converter. So, what is the reconstruction filter at the D to A converter? How do we understand that? This is how you do. You take your input signal coming from your processor, which is your D to A converter. Assume your D to A is an ideal D to A converter. Ideal, right? Remember, it won't be ideal. What will you get? You get like that, you get like that, and you get like that. And we have already talked about it that uh, it doesn't matter. We can cancel out this effect. So what we get is the ideal D to A converter. The outputs are just the samples. One, two, like an impulse coming out. Impulse, not square pulses. It is a if it's a non-ideal, you'll get spare pulses. If it's an ideal this way, you get impulses. And then what happens? This impulse goes to the low pass filter. Low pass filter that we have is same as the pre-filter in anti aliasing filter. This filter is we can assume this filter has an low pass filter has got a frequency response like this. And this is the half the sampling frequency. And it's an ideal low pass filter. I want to know, a lot of people want to know, if this is your signal you are getting here, look. This is your D2A converter coming out like that. This is your staircase that you are getting out of it. How does this low pass filter actually smooth out? Uh, one explanation is these this jumps are high frequency component. When you put a low pass filter, it removes the high frequency, so it will just give you a nice smooth act. That's one explanation. But instead of that, we have to prove mathematically. So how do you do that? You take this frequency spectrum and find out the inverse Fourier transform of this, which you haven't done yet. 
which, which we will do a bit later, but you can assume for the moment. If you do the inverse Fourier transform of a low pass filter, what would you get? You give an impulse to a low pass filter, you will get a sync function like that. That's what sine phi over two sync function. For one inverse. So you are going to get many impulses. If we go back here, you got one, two, three, many impulses. So I can say this impulse produces a sync function like that. This impulse produces a sync function like that. This produces a sync function like that. If you add all the sync function, I think it's joined like nicely. So that's shown in the next slide. You go into the next slide and see we know one impulse produces a sync function. So you go into the next slide. Now you do a little bit of mathematics where your output signal, this is your low pass filter, this is your Y count, C coming in. This one converts with this input response, this is your output signal. We have just shown you that the input response is sine by T over T. You just assume that. And my input signal coming in is a delta because that's what I'm providing. That, 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 that. So a low pass filter. So this is delta T minus N T. That's what I'm providing. I can now say, in order to get my analog signal, I move this inside, and then I can rewrite this equation as Y N, summation as delta N T, converted with this one, you can switch this around, doesn't matter. So what does this mean? This means that you take your signal coming into the D2A converter, this is white capture, you get your signal coming into the D2A converter, and if you take that signal and multiply by a sync function, position that different n position, different time position, and if you add them all, you should get your output signal. It's a bit harder to understand. If you, if you, if you understood this, piece. all you are saying is that if this is your diagram, this is your impulse. So let me go back one more. This is your ideal D2A converter. This is coming from your processor, digital signal processor. This is your D2A converter giving you impulses, and that goes into a low pass filter, which has got an impulse response for HT. HT. So you say YT is my analog output equal to Y cap T is the ideal uh, uh, E2A converter output converted with HT is the inverse response. We have shown for a low pass filter, HT is sine X over X function. If it is pi over T here, the cutoff frequency, this becomes sine omega C over omega C. So in this case, if you go further, you see that this is our point, which is pi over t, t over pi over t. So that's your impulse response. Now we can say the impulse response can go with yt in the previous diagram gives you this. That means I move this inside, I can write this as yn, and that's can go with that one. So what, what does yt mean? What does the analog signal mean? Take my discrete signal coming into the D2A converter and multiply that signal by this sync function, which is shifted in time. So to symbolically see that, go to the next slide, which shows you better. We can use this property, xt delta nt is by that one, that we know, because delta is only at that position. So there's no point you're keeping this delta, so you can say xt is this. That means we can drop out the delta t in the previous equation. We can just do that, and that convolution gone. So that's what you were left with. So you were left with that. So the question is, right, now we can get from a D2A converter, yt comes out, take the yn, multiply by sine function or, 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 or sync function. If you do that, what you have is the original signal can be obtained by adding infinite number of sine x pulses shifted at different distance, nc, and multiplied by its appropriate weight. This process is called interpolation. That's what the low pass filter does. 
So look at the diagram. Here is the diagram. Take this sample. Uh, that sample came into the DT10 word head. And it will have a sync function, the low pass filter gives you. This value came into the DT10 word head. And a sync function comes in for that. And this value came in. And another sync function comes in. And all these values. And by the time you add them all, the four, these all added together, you get this dotted line comes in. That's your original state. Analog. So basically, passing through a low pass filter to join these edges is equal to interpolation, which is, this is how you explain, or this is how you prove that. Okay. So, we have got few problems with the D2A converter. D2A converter has got, when you send the output, the output comes there, so basically, if you look at this D2A converter, so, I have got signal coming in here, which I call YN. And I pass it through my D to A converter. D to A. This D to A converter has the shaping effect of being shown to that sin x over x frequency shaping. So we multiply the signal x over sin x first, so that will cancel out. When it comes out, it comes as pulses. Assuming it comes as pulses, it goes to our low power filter. And the low pass filter, what you have here, if you draw it, it looks like that the signal comes out of here. That level, that level, that level, that level, that level. Now, the low pass filter has smoothed out. It has joined on this nice. How did it smooth out low pass filter on its own? I have shown you by using this technique that low pass filter impulse response is a sync function. Every sample is, is, is multiplied by a sync function here like that and like that, and they're all being added in order to get your signal. That's the theory behind. This addition, this type is called as interpolation, interpolating the D2A output using the low pass filter in order to get your signal. If you do find it's difficult because you've done the transforms and understanding, just it doesn't matter for the moment. You can leave it for a while, and you can revisit this later on. So you can move forward and go to the next section, okay? D to A converter, and the problem involved in D to A is not simple as A to D converter. Okay. Now we're going to look at examples. Okay, I have explained A to D converter and the D to A converter sampling process and all of those. In summary, before I do an example, A to D converter, you must make sure you pre-filter the signal, analog signal, before you conversion. Second thing you have to make sure, you have to select the sampling frequency. If you not select the sampling frequency, you must know what's the bandwidth of the pre-filtered signal. Then you can have twice the maximum uh, bandwidth of the signal. So if your input signal is 4 kilohertz band with maximum, then 0 to 4 kilohertz, then the sampling frequency at least 8 kilohertz. That's the first thing you need to know. Second one, the A to D converter, you want to make sure A to D converter, how many bits. Then depends on the number of bits, you need to understand what's the resolution. Then you need to know how do you calculate the noise power. So then signal to quantization noise power calculation you need to know and what is quantization noise, how do you de uh, reduce the quantization noise, and then you need to understand that. And then A to D conversion process, and wha uh, how, what is the restriction, how fast can you sample, and that's related to A to D conversion process, you need to know. Then you have processed the signal, which we are not looking at it, you got the output of the process signal from the signal processor, goes into the D to A converter. D to A converter has got this sine over X spectral shaping, so in order to avoid that, you need to, before you feed the signal into a D2A converter, it has to be multiplied by X over sine X format, so they can cancel out. Then, when you get the output of the D2A converter, it's, it comes as a staircase, and they have to be smoothed out. In order to smooth out, you must use the low-pass filter. So what does the low-pass filter do? In frequency spectrum, you can say smoothing means taking out the high frequency. That means low-pass filter will do the job. Second way is showing an interpolation function, which is using a sync function, which I have shown. Okay? That's the summary of exactly what you have done so far.
Let us now look at some of the examples that you want. Consider an analog signal. It signals this and that and that. Three, three frequencies. What is the likeness rate of the signal? First you have to find out what are the frequencies available here. So the frequencies available are, you take this one and divide by 2, which is 2 pi ft, is that right? So this is 50 pi, so 2 is 25 hertz available. Here is again 150 hertz available. Here 50 hertz available. What's the maximum frequency available in this particular signal? It's 150 hertz. Therefore, that you want to make sure the sampling has to be greater than or equal to 2f max, which is 300 hertz is what you can go. So, Maxus rate is twice the maximum uh, uh, frequency content, which is 2F max, which is 300 hertz. 300 hertz is the Maxus frequency for this particular signal. So, if you are given a sinusoidal, work out the frequency content, and then pick up the maximum content, multiply by 2 would be the Maxus rate. Consider a signal here, xt equals to sine 10 sine 3 pi t. So, fs must be greater than twice the frequency. So, in our case, it's 300 hertz. Right, twice the frequency. So, if you draw a 300 hertz signal, it's like that, and all you are saying is, twice the frequency means you are taking two samples per cycle. That's all you are doing. If your frequency is, sampling should be twice the maximum frequency, means two samples per cycle. So, if your samples are here and here, then it's okay, you can reconstruct. But, if you have a pure sine wave and if your sample happens to be at that position and that position, that's also two samples, you can't reconstruct because this is a zero, zero. So, you must know that if you are going for nice to sampling, you must make sure that if you have got a sine wave, the sampling instant does not fall at the zero crossing. If it does fall at the zero crossing, it cannot reconstruct. It has to be outside the zero crossing, then you get. So if you put a sine wave from here, all your theory says is with two samples within a period, you can actually reconstruct the sine. And if you look at it, you will say, like there's one, if you join them, what you are getting is a, a, a triangular waveform actually. How do you get tri from triangular wave from the original signal? Then don't forget, the period is still there, so by low pass filtering you can get the signal no problem. That's what we do as an output DTA converter. So that's one point that you have to be careful about, okay? How do we convert an analog signal into a digital signal, okay? X10 equals to 10 times 300. You substitute T equals to NT, you done that. So 300 pi, T is 1 over FS. So you can, you, you, can, you can put in the value that you want, and FS is 300, therefore this is your digital signal. Your analog signal is now converted into digital signal. That's just an example I'm just showing to you. And this is your converted digital signal. So this example basically says, if you've got a single sine wave, be careful where you're sampling it. If the sample is falling at that zero crossing, you've got problems. So basically sampling theorem says, by taking two samples per cycle, you can actually reconstruct. And that is true. Now, that's the part I'm expecting. If the sampling of the analog spine first at the zero crossing, hence we miss the signal completely. Okay. In such cases, what you do, you say that you add on a little bit of phase so you don't sample or those zero crossing, you sample slightly pushed away. That's what it just says. So by pushing, uh, uh, introducing a small phase, you will get sine this, you expand this using sine A, the sine B formula, which is, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, sine A plus B is equal to sine A cos B plus cos A sine b. Using that formula you expand it and from that you can say that uh, um, cos uh, sine pi n is going to be zero. So that you left with that. Therefore, by introducing a small uh, 
pi into it, even if you cross at n equal to zero, you, even that, that will go to one, but always there will be an output. It will never be at zero percent. So it says that instead of crossing it there, you could, by pushing a phase, you will always push it away from the zero percent. That's just a theory, just to show. I mean, it's not maybe important. Um, like, it never happened in real time because you will never be sampling sine wave or pure sine wave from, uh, and is always speech wave from any signal that's got not a single sine, many sine wave from. So you can sample at any instant. You will never sample at zero crossing. So I don't think it's a major issue. Uh, this is like, I'm, I'm just continuing and explaining this. I mean, that, that's just taken as okay. Here's an analog signal, x equal a, uh, 2 pi f naught is a continuous time signal. And how do you convert them into discrete time signal? I, we have done that before. It just shows you that. And you have to make sure that that signal, your signal uh, uh, has to be within the half the sampling period. Yeah? You, ma you have to pre-filter that. That's what it says. Right. If you if you look at this particular example here, x t equal to a cos two pi k t. This this is periodic. Therefore, I can say f k. I can write as f known plus k f s, where k is one, two, three, and they are they are. One sampling, two sampling, three sampling, and four sampling. So, if you use this formula, and if you if you just continue continue substituting, I can show you that if you have a signal which is not within the fundamental region, what we are trying to show you is that a signal which is not within the fundamental region, but outside the region can also come back into the into into your original signal. Just have a look at this one. X n equal to A cos two pi F K F S. This should be F naught normally. I'm saying instead of F naught it is a multiple of sampling frequency. For some reason I've got a frequency which is multiple of sampling frequency added to that value. So a frequency this is my fundamental point in the minus pi to plus pi. But I've got a frequency here which is k plus k, f naught plus k f s. And you will find that signal can also be reflected inside. And you can see here that if I substitute s k equal to k f s, you can see here f naught plus k f s. And if I just simplify this, it comes 2 pi f naught over f n plus 2 pi k n. And you know 2 pi k n is 2 pi f naught over f s. So all you are saying is this is what you will get. So this tells you if you have a frequency which is not f naught but f naught plus k f s after you sample it, you will see this frequency which is different as though it is f naught. So in fundamental diagram you will draw like this. It's a, it's a very important concept you need to know. You have, ah, sorry. You have got, this is your digital spectrum. And say you've got a frequency content here, which is equal to F naught. Also, you've got a content here, which is an alias content, which is F naught plus K times of FS. It's related to sampling frequency. And that signal can be reflected in here, and even though this is not present. So if you don't have this frequency available, but if this frequency is already available, when you do a sampling, that will reflect in, and you will get a wrong impression as to this signal is there. That's not the signal. That is one of these problems in aliasing that you will learn a bit more later on. I have shown you that by taking a new frequency, which is not in the fundamental region at all, it's not here, it's not 
here at all, but is here and translated into the fundamental region. I say here, F0 plus KSS, I put it in here and expand this one, and I can show you this is equal to this. So suddenly you see, I didn't have any fundamental frequency, but when I look at the spectrum, I have a, a fundamental frequency or uh, frequency in that region, which is wrong. So that's the problem of aliasing. Basically, it says a signal, if you look at it, it says a si signal sa sampled at, at rate FS, it is clear that the frequency FK, which is outside the fundamental frequency range, con consequently the sample signal A is this. If you have a signal outside the region, you can still end up as though it's your original signal. So which is identical to the discrete time signal in the equation. So if you are given a sequence Xn, there is an ambiguity as to which continuous time signal Xt these values represent. So we can say, right, frequencies Fk plus F0 Ks are indistinguishable. We cannot distinguish them. We cannot do them. Because a frequency outside the sampling can also be seen as as though it's inside. Hence, hence, they are aliases of F0, we call it. It's an F0 alias. Earlier we said sampling frequency problem, we talked about it. Now we're talking about another one, which is multiple of sampling frequencies somewhere else can be seen as as though it was present in the fundamental region. So we have problem. If FS is the sampling frequency, FS over 2 corresponds to, we have done this before, which is equal to pi. FS2 is the highest frequency that can represent unity in the sampling wave. FS2 is called folding, uh, is called folding frequency or half the sampling frequency. That's the name as well. Let's take this example to illustrate this aliasing problem. Here's the analog signal given. What's the Nyquist frequency? So let's find out the frequency. That is 1000 hertz, 3000 hertz, 6000 hertz. 1 kilohertz, 3 kilohertz, 6 kilohertz. So the highest frequency is 6. According to the sampling, the Nyquist rate should be twice the highest, which is 12 kilohertz. Perfectly okay. If you use 12 kilohertz, we are in, we are in safe hand. Assume that you are sampling at 5 kilohertz. So your signal is, goes up to 6 kilohertz. That's what your program shows. It goes up to 6 kilohertz, and you are sampling at 5 kilohertz. So what will, ha what will happen? You are causing aliasing. You can't do that. So you will not be able to reconstruct the signal at all because you're co aliasing. So I will show now you will get new signal, not that uh, signal back, a new signal going to come back. So you have a look, the next one. So I'm going to sample at 5 kilohertz. So my sam half the sampling is 2,500 hertz. So I'm going to rewrite the equation, right? 3 cos 2 pi 1,000, that and that. I convert that into analog, digital form, T is equal to N T. T replaced by N T as N over F S. Right? So I'm going to say 3 cos 2 pi is still here. 1000 is here. Instead of T, N over F S. Similarly, I do for everything N over F S, N over F S, everything. I write them down. And I simplify this. I will get a signal that, that, and that. Now, if I simplify this trigonometrically, I get 1 over 5. I can write this as 1 minus 2, 5. I can write this as 1 plus 1 over 5. And cos 2 pi minus 2 over 5 is 2, minus 2 over 5. And cos 2 pi plus 1 over 5 is cos plus 2 pi 1 over 5. And if you, if you add these together in the next page, you will get eventually a signal, this one and this one. 
basically you can simply say, well, this, if you go back in time domain, they don't look like the original. The original had three components, you end up with two components. That is because you choose the rogue sampling frequency. It should have been 12 kilohertz. You choose uh, uh, 5 kilohertz, therefore it's aliasing. Same thing can be redone in a different method. Let's look at the method. Sampling frequencies, 5 kilohertz. Half the sampling is 2.5. Let's go and look at this technique. Our new frequency is F node plus KFS. So our F node is FK minus KFS. Okay? So, what are we going to do? We say if the frequency is 1000 hertz, you have half the sampling is 2500, no aliasing comes. So that frequency will not be affected. However, the other two frequencies, F2 and F3, will be affected because they are, uh, uh, they are 3000 hertz and 6000 hertz. You are sampling at 2500 hertz. So what would be the new frequency will be caused because you are, see, your frequencies are here. This is your frequency available. One, two, three. This is, what, first one is what, 1000, 1K, 3K, 6K. This is what available. So the sampling should be 12K. This is what you should sample at 12K. At best should be 12K. So what you are doing sampling is at at 5 kilohertz, so you're sampling and that's your sampling frequency there. So that means half the sampling is 2.5. So any frequencies up to that will not be alias. Anything about that, about this frequency, this is 2.5, that's the half the sampling. And this is 5. Anything about that will be alias. So these two frequencies are going to be alias. In, into, into, it has a new frequency. So let's find out. So we can find out, rather than the way we did before, we say our new frequency, this is called the alias frequency. This is called alias frequency. Using our formula, it's equal to our second frequency, which is 3000, minus 1 times of fs. k is 1, because they're not that far away. So that's subtracted, you get minus 2 kilohertz. You get a new frequency, minus 2 kilohertz. So this frequency is being translated into minus 2 kilohertz. So new frequency has appeared, even though it's not in the spectrum. And then you do the third frequency, alias frequency, 6000 minus 5000, which is 1 kilohertz. So this 6000, which is outside, is now going into here as 1 kilohertz. So you can see, when you select the wrong sampling, the frequencies which are outside the uh, uh, half the sampling uh, uh, period, half the sampling region, will reflect back inside by using this formula. Now you know the three frequency of one, two. Now if you write the this three signal, which is three cos two pi, first one is 1000 over 500, no aliasing. Second one is alias to minus 200, 2000, so that's right. And the third one is 10 cos two pi, alias to 1000. So the, you know the formula anyway, yeah? So you, you can, you can see that if you add them, that this, this will give you one frequency, these two are one frequency, this is the second frequency. You started with three frequencies, you end up with two frequencies, you have caused distortion in the signal. So there's two ways of calculating the, this equation, one using the trigonometric identity, I saw the first way, second one is using this aliasing, uh, alias frequency equation. So if you go back and work out the analog signal, what is the analog signal then? You say, right, since only frequency components 1 kilohertz and 2 are present in the sample, they will turn out to be 13 cos 2000. If you go back here, these two are added up. So that will be 10 plus 3 is 13, 2 pi, and they belong 1000 hertz. So 2 pi 1000 T, so that's the first one. 2 by 1000 T, well, 2 by 1000 mean 2000 by T. And the next one is this one, which is 2 times the 2, 4, 4 by T. So 4000 by T. That's your signal. Which is ob obviously different from the original signal. 
the distortion of the original analog signal caused by aliasing effect due to the low sampling rate used. You have completely did the wrong sampling rate. I have shown you. This is just showing in time domain what happened. You can draw the picture and show in frequency domain as well, which I have done before. So the last example here is an uh, example, another example, the analog signal XT, that's uh, XT, is sampled at 6,000 times per second. Determine the night uh, sampling frequency. So, and then determine the folding frequency, and what are the frequencies and radians in the discrete time signal. D is what is the reconstructed signal. These are the four parts. Let's, let's look at one at a time. First one is This is your signal. Find out the frequency. That's uh, first frequency 2,400 because 2 pi is here. Second is 3,600. Okay. So the maximum frequency is 360. So 9 plus has to be 720. But you are sampling at, um, at 600 hertz. So your folding frequency, half the sampling is 300. Naturally, this is going to be aliased, whereas this is fine. 240 hertz is fine. This is going to be alias. If this is going to be alias, well, how do we calculate that? Okay. Next line. This is what you do. Uh, basically, you calculate. You, you can go back and say, right, this is 240 divided by 600. This is, this is like sine n theta. So n sine n theta is 2 pi. Analog frequency over sampling frequency. That's what you use to apply analog SA, SS principles. And you just keep simplifying this, this one and this one. If you add them or subtract them, this is your signal you get. It's minus 2 pi 4 over n. This is your digital signal. You started with two frequencies, you ended up with one frequency. That means your coarse aliasing. And the second method you can use, you use and find out where is the ABS frequency. So for 300 hertz, uh, uh, for this one, nothing happens, not affected by aliasing. 360 is just affected because it was half the sum is 300. So find the affected aliasing frequency, which is F1 minus 1 FS, F360 minus uh, 600. And if you work that out, you get 240 hertz you get. So you get another frequency created. And so you got a one frequency and, and minus two forty is created. If you add them all together, this is the value you get. And if you want to look at what would you get, this is equal to two forty over six hundred, right? And if you convert that into time, like you will get this as four eighty pi t. And you know how to do that? You know how to go from here to here. These are unaffected. Only this part affected, so you just work it out using omega t equal to theta, and using that principle, you can work out that this will be 480. And what happened is that t is equal to n t, which is n over f s. So wherever n over f s, which is in this case, is n over f s is that part, that is replaced by t, small t there. And these two are combined with 480. That's your analog signal. That's your signal out of the D to A converter. So basically, that is not correct. Because you gave two analog signals, you only got one out. So just to summarize everything what we have done so far, bit rate is the new terminology you will know. Sampling frequency is multiplied by number of bits. Each sample is how many bits? It's called bit rate, which is 8,000 samples per second. It's sampling multiplied by 12 bits here. Using, for example, is 96,000 samples per second, which is which is called a bit trade of an ATD converter. So, for example, 12 bit ATD converter, 8,000 sampling, 12 bits comes out, means every second you get 96,000 samples coming out here. Every second you measure, 96,000 samples comes out. In the case of PCM, peak signals are filtered. Normally, to get up to 3.4 kilohertz, sampled at 8,000 hertz. So the value is in that region. 8-bit compressed PCM we use. We use a different technique, not a linear PCM. 
and 8 bits per sample you get. So when you work out the bit rate, 8 times 8 is 64,000 bits per second will come out in, uh, in, in compass PCM. In a linear PCM, it will come out as 96, whereas here is 64 uh, 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 bits per second. Another example here, you've got your CD, normal, normal um, uh, music CD here, 16 bits, normally we do. It's a 44.1 kilohertz sampling. You use the CD reader to read it, oh, and 16 bit D2A you have inside, and low pass filter, and pass through amplifier or headphone. And this is wrong, that's seven, that's not right. Uh, just check this one, I think it's 705 here, I think the bit, point, uh, the point is wrong. So, you will find the bit rate is very, very high for a CD, but that's how you get high quality if you want, unless you do compression technique, but compression means you have to decompress, that takes time, like MP3, where you compress them, MP3 players are available, but nowadays, but going back in time, it was very difficult. So if you do MP3 compression, you can compress a lot of things in one CD, and you could have a... 20 songs uh, without compression as opposed to 90 MP3 uh, compression. More than that you can have nowadays, but I'm just giving it one equivalent. So, basically, that's your first part of Chapter 3. I've just done the first part of Chapter 3 end, and uh, uh, Chapter 3 part A signal posting, that's your first part. I'll produce this as one CD, and then the next part will come as in the CD. Okay, uh, that's all for today, and, and thanks, I'll talk to you again.